one who sees danger and respects being heedful, something we chant every week. And where does that respect lead? It leads to being in the presence of nirvana. It's because it leads there that that's why it's so important. Some people say, accuse Buddhism of being very pessimistic and negative, focusing only on suffering and stress as if they were denying that there was any pleasure in life. The Buddha never denies pleasure. He talks about it very openly. But the problem with pleasure is that it leads us to be complacent. Things go well and we start getting lazy. And we just stay right there. Life doesn't get any better than that, as long as we're complacent. It's when we're heedful and realize that there's, okay, there's something better than this, ordinary, everyday pleasures. Something that's not mixed up with ordinary, everyday pains. That's when we start getting heedful, realizing that unless we do something about it, the state of our minds, we're not going to get any better than this. And so the purpose of learning about how to get to nirvana, that's why the Buddha has his focus on pain, suffering, stress however you want to translate dukkha. Because it's in understanding how the mind puts suffering together. That's how we begin to un untangle all the mind's attachments and all the ways that it makes creates unnecessary problems for itself. And at the same time, we start opening ourselves up to something better. So we focus on suffering because it's a learning opportunity. In fact, I, the Buddha actually has this Treat suffering with respect, calls it a noble truth. It's not just an ordinary, everyday, all truth. He says, look at it as a noble truth, something that's worthy of respect, something that's worthy of comprehension, really looking into it. Don't dismiss it. Don't try to run away from it. Open yourself up to learning from it. And there's room for respect for happiness as well. If you search around in the Noble Truths, you find happiness, pleasure, rapture tucked away under the, the Fourth Noble Truth in right concentration. That's the kind of happiness you can learn from, the happiness that comes together with mindfulness, real clarity. Because on the one hand, it puts the mind in a state where it can see suffering and not be threatened by it. And at the same time, that kind of happiness itself ultimately becomes an object of, that you want to explore. You use it as a tool, and then when you've taken it as far as it can take you, then you turn around and start exploring that as well. And you begin to see that there's even some stress and suffering in there. So these are the things we should have respect for. Respect for suffering and respect for the right kind of happiness. That's why the Buddha calls them noble truths. Because if we don't have respect for these things, where does our complacency lead us? Well, the Buddha says complacency is the path to death. And the complacent are as if already dead. In other words, they're not alive to the opportunities that lie before us. If we really do follow the path, if we're diligent in it, keep with it, stick at it, stick with it, it opens us up to nirvana. And when people reach nirvana, they look back on the pleasures of their daily lives before and they say, my gosh, that was an awful lot of burden and an awful lot of stress compared to what they found. Our problem is that we haven't reached the point where they are, so pleasures look pleasurable to us. They look pretty good. We don't think we want to give them up quite yet. Or we get a nice spot in our meditation, we say, well, this isn't so bad. We can, we can stay right here for a fair while. But it's all so precarious. Stress is built into not only the first noble truth, but the second and the fourth. This was part of the Buddha's genius. I mean, he 
once you'd achieved, once you'd obtained or experienced what is uncompounded or unconditioned, he looked back at conditioned reality and saw that in comparison all of it was stressful. All of it was burdensome. But he also saw that you can't take the compounded, or the uncompounded and use it as a path to the uncompounded. Things don't work that way. You have to learn how to take the compounded and use it as a path. So he divided compounded reality, things that are made up of causes and conditions, divided into three things. Stress, its cause, and the path to its end. And gave us a task for each of them. Our task is to comprehend the stress and suffering, abandon the cause, and develop the path. Ultimately, though, you get to the point where you, stress has been comprehended, its cause has been abandoned, and the only thing left is to relinquish the path itself. So this is why the Buddha has his focus on the issue of stress, and particularly the stress that comes with clinging. Because when we see it, the, the suffering that comes with clinging, then we, we need to stop being so complacent about our clings, about our attachments. Because you begin to realize even the most subtle form of pleasure on the everyday level has some clinging mix into it. And that particular clinging opens the bridge for all kinds of suffering to come into the mind. Once you build that kind of bridge to things, anybody can come over the bridge. Pleasure can come over the bridge. Pain can come over the bridge. Once you latch onto the body, say, this is me, this is mine, you lay claim to it. Okay, whatever happens to the body suddenly becomes a burden to the mind. We latch onto it because we find that there's certain pleasures in the body. But once that bridge is open, okay, all the pains can come along as well. So I try to get the mind into a state of good, solid concentration so it can look back on those attachments with some detachment, some objectivity and see all the things that we've clinged to that we really like and really, really identify with. It's not really us. And there really is some problem holding on in that way. And when the mind is in good enough state, shape, it can, it's willing to let go. So when the Buddha has his focus on the stress and suffering that comes from clinging, it's not like he's trying to badmouth the world or deny pleasure. It's, he's just saying, okay, there's something better than this. And the way to find that something better is to focus on the way the mind reacts to pain. If you really want to understand the mind, that's the place to understand it. Because all the issues in the mind come thronging around the pain. Whereas ordinary, everyday pleasure just tends to cover things up. Things are not as clear. And so this is why the Buddha has us have respect for the the sufferings that we undergo, because we can learn from them. There's an interesting passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about the reason for respect, and they say it's basically to learn. When there's respect, you open up your mind. There's a possibility of learning something new where there's respect. If there's no respect, the mind is closed. It dismisses things really easily. And as a result, it loses a really good opportunity to learn. This is why the whole attitude of respect is built into the Buddha's teachings. A lot of people think that Buddhism is an interesting philosophy, perhaps a very good philosophy that somehow got a religion tacked onto it, with all the bowing and all the other things that go along with religion. And they'd like to separate the two. Can't we just have the philosophy without the religion? But if you look at the nature of the Buddha's philosophy, his teachings on the Four Noble Truths, the whole etiquette of respect is built in to the teaching itself. When you realize, okay, the whole issue here is the possibility of either a great deal of pain or a lot of pleasure, true pleasure. It puts an edge on the, on the teaching. It's not just a interesting description of things, but it points out this is a dilemma that we're all placed in. We've got to do something about it. You have any concern for your own well-being. 
You've got to take these truths seriously. Unfortunately, the nature of suffering is something that you can learn from and something that you can do something about. The whole teaching on causality, the fact that your experience of the present is a combination of past factors plus your present input, means that you can develop skill in this area. If everything were totally predetermined, that everything would be just like a machine, and there would be no reason for respect, because you couldn't learn anything useful about it. You'd just be stuck in the machine, couldn't do anything about it. If everything were totally uncaused and totally random, okay, again, there'd be no reason for respect. There'd be nothing to learn, because what you learned at work today wouldn't necessarily work tomorrow. But our experience is determined by patterns of causality, with some influence coming in from the past, but also a possibility for us to do something about it right here, right now. And that's why respect is built into that causality. One, respect for the principle itself. There's something to learn from, but it's complex. And after all that kind of causality the Buddha talks about, that's what creates chaos theory, which means it causes it all that simple. So there's a lot to be learned. It's right here in the present moment, which means that you have to have respect for your own ability to learn as well. After all, all the causes the Buddha talks about are things that are right here. When he, uses, when he describes causality, he says, this comes with that. When there is this, there is that. Okay, the this and the that are things that are right here in front of us. So on the one hand, you have to have respect for your own ability, but two, since it is complex and it's such an important issue, it's wise to have respect for people who have followed the path and gotten results. That's why we pay so much respect to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, so we don't have to keep reinventing the Dharma wheel. So there are three things we have to respect that are based on this principle of causality. One, the principle itself. Because reality is not totally arbitrary. You can't just make up things. You can't decide, well, today I'm going to act on desire and I'm going to make desire a good thing. Okay, if it's an unskillful quality in the mind, it's going to lead to unskillful actions. There's no way around that. That's the part of reality where you just keep banging your head against it, unless you learn to have some respect for it. Secondly, respect for yourself, your own ability to do the practice. And also at the same time having respect for your desire to gain true happiness. Because the ordinary way of the world is saying, oh, true happiness, unchanging happiness, forget about it. Focus instead on the things that we can sell to you. Focus, you know, lower your sights. That's what the world says. The Buddha says, no, have respect for your desire for true happiness. When you get complacent, okay, you've lost respect for that desire. When you're heedful, okay, you're keeping that desire in mind, showing it the proper respect. So in respect for yourself, it means two things. One, respect for your desire for true happiness, and two, respect for your, de your ability to do something about it. That's built into the principle of causality as well. And finally, given the complexity of the principle, it means respect for those who have followed the path. Like someone like the Buddha who discovered the path, and the Sangha people who have followed the Buddha's example and found the same freedom, total freedom, suffering, the same true happiness. Respect for the teaching that the Buddha and the Sangha have passed on. Okay, when you have this proper attitude of respect, you know, respect for heedfulness, proper respect for stress and pain, respect for the kind of happiness that forms the, the heart of the path, and respect for concentration, that's also in the chant. <coughs> that's the attitude that will bring you to the presence of nirvana. 
So there's no clear-cut line between Buddhism as a philosophy and Buddhism as a the more religious side of Buddhism, where the whole etiquette of respect comes in. What's important, though, is that we understand the attitude of respect. As the Buddha said, there's one passage where he talks about one you know, attitude of respect gives you a grounding, and two, it enables you to learn. The purpose of respect is to learn, to open your mind. Because not only does it open your mind, but when other people see that you're respectful of the truth, they're happy to teach whoever has any knowledge. is willing to share it. In fact, for the monks, we're supposed to have respect for everybody. If someone criticizes the monk, the monk is supposed to treat that person with respect, whether the person's right, whether they're wrong. Try to keep an open mind, because many times you learn from people you wouldn't expect might have something good to say. So we're taught never to be dismissive. When we're criticized. Because after all, the principle of causality is right here in the present, not only for you to observe, but also for other people to observe as well. So everyone has that potential to have some very useful observations. This is why John Fu one time said that an attitude of respect is a sign of intelligence. If you want to learn, if you want to master the way to the end of suffering, okay, an attitude of respect is a very important quality. Respect for heedfulness, realizing okay, that the principle of causality means that there's great potential for danger. If we misuse that principle, we can cause ourselves a lot of unnecessary suffering. But the respect for the training, the respect for concentration, okay, that's respect for our potential to use that principle of causality for very good ends. Total release, total freedom. So instead of being negative or pessimistic, the Buddhist teachings are extremely positive, much more positive than anything else in the world. They said that our desire for true happiness is realistic. Worthy of the highest respect. 